So good morning. Um, now we get to talk about something a little nicer at the other spectrum instead of high-risk patients. Um, we're going to talk about patients with smoldering myeloma, but then asking the question, um, whom do we treat, when do we treat? Okay, magic mover. Okay, so what we're going to go over, first we need to talk about the new definitions of myeloma and smoldering myeloma, and then we'll move to that question about whom do we treat. So um, you're all aware that smoldering myeloma is actually a very heterogeneous entity. This curve will show you uh, the red curve. You can see that in the first five years, the rate of progression is about 10% per year. However, if one moves on to the next five years, the rate of progression is different. It's only 3% per year. And then finally, uh, further on, the rate of progression slows, and it's actually akin to MGUS. And so, again, this term, smoldering myeloma, it's really, in a way, a placeholder for um, a group of patients that we don't understand very well. And so this is obvious to everyone, and the idea came up that perhaps we can pull patients out of the smoldering category that are at the highest risk, and maybe they're, just call them myeloma. And so about five years ago or so, um, the IMWG said, well, what if we could find risk factors um, that would predict that within two years, 70 or 80 percent of patients would progress. Perhaps we shouldn't call those patients smoldering myeloma, but actually reclassify them. So if one does the exercise of looking at all of these different um, progression uh, uh, categories or, or schemas, um, you can see here the yellow uh, stands for two years, uh, and you can see that the higher risk is typically in red. And if you look at, for example, looking at just bone marrow plasma cells greater than 10 percent and uh, M spike of uh, greater than three grams per deciliter, that does not meet that threshold of hitting 70 or 80 percent within the first two years. If one adds in an abnormal free light chain ratio of just a, of eight, um, that also does not uh, meet those criteria. However, if you look at um, an involved free light chain ratio of greater than 100, you can see that approximately 80% of patients are, are progressing within the first two years. Similarly, if you look at the next uh, category and then two after that, if you look at different, uh, looking at fish, risk of uh, fish cytogenetic abnormalities, again, you see that um, those really don't meet the mark. And then if we look at aberrant plasma cells uh, and suppression of immunoglobulins, again, you're not getting to the 70 to 80 percent, but all the way at the end, you can see bone marrow plasma cells being greater than 10 percent gets us there. Um, the greater than one focal lesion on MRI or two lesions on MRI also uh, meets the mark. One of the things that wasn't on the table when um, all of this work was being done to formalize new definitions uh, is really interesting work that uh, Dr. L um, Langren referred to uh, is this multi-parameter flow. Not only is it good for minimal residual disease, but one can come up with an aberrant phenotype that one can classify patients into that clinically are smoldering myeloma, but characterize them as having a MGUS type phenotype or more of a myeloma type phenotype of their bone marrow plasma cells. And so that's what's done here in a group of smoldering myeloma patients. The green uh, is the, are the patients that have the MGUS-like profile, and then the red is, are those with the myeloma-like profile, and then the orange are the ones with more of a smoldering, and if you look to the right, you can see that the time to progression is about 15 months in those smolderers, clinical smolderers, um, that have this phenotype. So if this can be reproduced, maybe this will be yet another group of patients. So with all that information in mind, um, the IMWG 
published in Lancet Oncology just last year the revised definition of multiple myeloma. Uh, and so one of the first points was that uh, it's no longer called symptomatic myeloma, it's just called myeloma because myeloma does not require the presence of symptoms anymore. So CRAB still stands, but this concept of myeloma-defining events, what I just told you, that abnormal free light chain, uh, the higher bone marrow plasma cells of greater than 60 percent, uh, and the uh, more than one lesion on MRI uh, is now going to be sufficient. And so, again, it, it was validated in at least two studies. Um, each of these variables, uh, the bone marrow plasma cells greater than 60 percent, the involved free light chain ratio greater than 100, and whole body MRI, two-year risk of progression 70 to 90 percent. This probably takes up around 15 percent of the smoldering, uh, the old smoldering patients. And uh, so we're not getting rid of all of smoldering, but these are the new criteria. And so, again, if one looks at the new diagnosis or the new criteria for myeloma all the way on the right, you have uh, those variables in there. And then in smoldering, you have a little bit of change because it's not just greater than 10 percent plasma cells, but it's up to 60 percent bone marrow plasma cells. And then also added in is no MDE and also um, the greater than 500 milligram per 24 hours urine M protein to kind of just characterize what smoldering myeloma is in terms of those Benz Jones uh, patients. So other things in the new criteria, just to clarify, um, CT and PET scan can now be used to de detect osteolytic bone lesions. Osteoporosis and compression fractures alone are not considered myeloma-defining events. Instead of the, the creatinine of uh, two, now it's been expanded to creatinine clearance of less than 40, can be used as a cutoff for renal failure in addition to the serum creatinine. Infections and hyperviscosity are not enough to qualify as myeloma-defining events, and anemia and hypercalcemia are unchanged. What about PET, you may ask? Again, there wasn't uh, much data, so only one could use the data that existed. This is just some preliminary information about PET scan uh, from our institution, 198 patients who were clinically initially thought to be smoldering. 82 of them were PET positive, 116 were PET negative. Um, but when more testing was done in the PET negative ones, 17 were called myeloma as other tests came in, um, but 89 were observed as smoldering myeloma. In the PET positive group, 49 at, the, at that time point were called myeloma, diagnosed. There were other things that were going on that made it clear it was myeloma. 12 were upstaged by PET scan, and 33 were observed as smoldering myeloma. So if we sort of focus on this retrospective study, but just trying to collect some data, um, what happens to these people with PET positive and uh, PET negative? And so by two years, uh, it was about a 56 percent progression amongst those who had PET positivity. And I'm not talking about osteolysis. I'm just talking about FDG avidity. Uh, and then we have 28 percent in the PET negative that progressed at the two-year and if one just includes those patients that had the PET within 90 days of diagnosis, you have a, a two-year progression rate of 74 percent in the PET positive group uh, versus the 27 percent. So again, maybe down the road we'll, you know, officially say PET could be something to help um, move patients out of the smoldering category into the active myeloma category, but those aren't uh, part of the definition as of yet. So now getting to that question, whom to treat? So obviously our motto, first do no harm, um, primum non nocere. There's been work done over the years in terms of what happens if you give patients some therapy. And so these are pilot and phase two studies, and it's just really just accumulating, uh, you know, the studies here, not for you to study and learn each of them because they're only pilot and phase two, and there's only so much you're going to learn from that. 
in terms of true outcomes. And so I'm not going to spend uh, much time on this slide, but you can see different things have been used back in the day, melphalamprednisone, um, bisphosphonates, thalidomide, IL-1 receptor antagonist, curcumin, uh, and then our, our carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dex. But the, I think more of the meat comes in when you look at the randomized trials. And again, most of these studies are old, but you know, back in the day when it was only melphalan and prednisone, early versus delayed, um, there really was no difference in overall survival amongst this very small randomized trial of 50 patients. Another uh, study, melphalan, prednisone, early versus delayed, again, there was um, Again, no difference or a trend towards a better outcome in patients not treated early. Um, again, you have alkylate or the risk of leukemia, et cetera. So that's where this watch and wait really came from. But then as time moved on and we had other tools, we have the bisphosphonate, so pomidronate, zomeda, and long and short, no real difference in overall survival. However, uh, and even in overall uh, progression-free survival, not a significant difference, but there was a difference in terms of skeletal events. Uh, and so look, if you use bisphosphonate, uh, you'll have fewer skeletal events. We have to remember, even in the patients who have MGUS, those patients are found to have more osteoporosis. So whether you have a smolderer patient or an MGUS patient, it's probably a good idea to do a bone density and think, you know, do they have osteoporosis that you you want to treat. And then we have things like um, thalidomide plus omeda versus omeda. And again, a difference in progression-free survival using the IMID, uh, but again, so far, no significant difference in overall survival. The most important study, however, is the one you're sure all aware of, is Lendax versus um, observation. And we're going to talk more about that in greater detail. But in short, there was a difference in progression-free survival, and there also was a difference in overall survival. So this is the trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a couple of years ago now. And it was basically induction with nine cycles of standard Lendex, followed by just then lenalidomide maintenance versus observation. And uh, the primary endpoint was uh, progression to symptomatic myeloma, and secondary endpoints are the usual suspects. In terms, now this was for high-risk patients. It wasn't for all patients. Um, high risk for this particular study was defined as not the highest of the ultra-high risk as now we define it. Uh, that is now myeloma, but uh, basically patients who had greater than 10% bone marrow plasma cells and an M protein of 30 um, or 3 grams per deciliter or 30 grams per liter, or basically um, immunoparesis or the aberrant bone marrow plasma cells, as well as the 10% uh, bone marrow plasma cells and um, the bigger M spikes. And so overall, um, if you look at the characteristics, these patients were well balanced in terms of everything. The only thing that's a little different is the observation group was 69 versus the treatment group being only uh, 63 years of age. Um, but when you look at the uh, time to progression, uh, you can see clearly there's a big difference between the two groups. Um, not reached for the um, lenalidomide treated patients versus a 21 month median time to progression. And the progression events were important things, you know, bone disease in 21 patients and uh, renal failure in eight. And importantly as well is there was a signal here in terms of overall um, survival improvement. Uh, so you can see here that at three years, you have 94% alive versus 80% alive. Now, there are limitations in this study. Obviously, um, patients who were treated with the, uh, on the treatment arm, um, as they tapered off of the lenalidomide or they tapered off the DEX, they were allowed to add it back on if things were progressing. There was a higher dropout rate um, in the treatment group, actually, than in the observation group, whether that was a, a lack of tolerance for observing patients when the numbers were creeping up, because the time to progression, you had to wait till patients had bona fide crab in order to say, okay, we're going to move on. Uh, this is a true progression. And I think that in real life, most people 
despite what the criteria used to say or did say, you know, if somebody's creatinine started out at 0.9 and it's 1.5 or 1.7, you weren't necessarily going to wait for that crab of two. Um, so this is a very important study because it shows that there are definitely patients that may be benefited by being treated. Um, this is just some information showing that you can get uh, responses, even some CRs. 26% uh, of patients got CR uh, in the treatment arm. Um, adverse events, uh, obviously, uh, this may be hard. No, nope, you can see it. Um, if circled um, vertically is the grade threes. You can see that in the treatment arm, there's a few grade threes. We're talking less than 10% in the various categories, whereas in observation, you don't see that. Um, but essentially, it is a well-tolerated therapy. DVT rates were low as well. And so the lessons learned um, treating patients with higher risk smoldering myeloma can prevent morbidity and mortality. Um, waiting for end organ damage alone to start therapy may increase morbidity and mortality. But the question is now, um, how do, what do we do with this particular clinical trial in the context of the new definition of myeloma pulling out the high-risk smolderers? What's the true overlap between that Spanish study, high risk, and now the ultra-high-risk smolderers that are now actually called myeloma? Um, we don't know the answer to that. Um, because again, I'm just showing you on the left, this was high risk according to the Pathema study. Those were the criteria that they were using. Uh, and then on the right are the criteria that have now been peeled off into being active myeloma. Um, and you can see that the, the two-year rates of progression are very different. So you know, a big question is what to do with smoldering, and this is a slide from Ola Langren. Um, you know, one approach is saying, well, golly, if you have you know something smoldering myeloma, Dr. Gobriel, you know, calls it before it becomes malignant, you know, early disease myeloma. Um, what if you if you don't treat it, it's going to progress and it's going to it's going to get worse, and you're going to get clonal evolution and advanced disease. Um, if you um, treat early, perhaps you can get rid of some of those clones and either have um, some, a chronic disease state, or maybe you'll even cure it. Another approach, however, or model could be that if you have, we know that what goes on in the bone marrow is complex. There's an interaction between stromal cells. There's an interaction between um, the various subclones of our myelomas. We know that there is clonal evolution that makes, uh, again, different uh, survival mechanisms in each of the myeloma cells or subpopulations. So what if at your beginning here at smoldering myeloma, you have a few malignant, more malignant uh, myeloma cells, and then you have a lot of the more benign uh, myeloma cells in there living happily with the stroma. You give chemotherapy, you reduce the tumor burden, but perhaps you kill the wimpier myeloma fast, faster, and now you've disrupted the homeostasis with death of the benign clone that was sort of competing in that space, and now you end up with a more aggressive state. Again, theoretical, it's something that we're going to need to understand. And so, how do the definitions, the new definitions, affect the management and prognosis of smoldering myeloma? So I showed you this curve before, and I'm going to do something that I'd advise you. Do not try this at home. Um, but the reality is, is now we've peeled off a portion of our patients. And hypothetically, perhaps now once we've pulled off this, um, those high, ultra high risk smolderers, maybe our smolderers are looking a lot more like MGUS. And we actually have to define better what's left. Now that we've peeled off the greater than 60% plasma cells, the greater than one lesion on MRI, and the uh, um, high free light chain ratio of greater than 100, maybe um, the smolderers should really, they have a very low risk of progressing. But we don't know that answer. We don't know any of these answers. And so there are a number of ongoing clinical trials for smoldering myeloma, and some of these are listed uh, right here, very innovative approaches. And so... Um, in conclusion, uh, I would suggest that uh, the only smolderers uh, who are uh, reclassified now as myeloma are the ones that should be treated. Uh, and then um, smoldering myeloma patients still at this day should only be treated on clinical trials. And uh, this is the Mayo Group, and I thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>